uh, but hello, my name is Ed Tausnick, and I'm New Jersey League of Conservation Voters Education Fund. Um, the Education Fund, uh, by way of background, is a nonpartisan tax deductible nonprofit, and we work to protect natural resources here in our state by raising awareness about key environmental challenges to bring together the environmental community um, and work to advance pro conservation policies. I'm working my to um, have good audio quality. Um, I'm not sure uh, what the hold up is, but I appreciate your patience. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining uh, this evening. Um, and the presentation is going to be on stormwater utilities. For those of you uh, who may have to, or for anyone else that on a reference to be posted on found at nglcv.org. Stormwater needs a new stormwater issue and facing a certain state, followed by a discussion of what the utilities are and how they can help. We'll conclude with how you can get more involved and a question and answer period. Just before we go any further, I'd like to introduce our speakers. First, we have uh, Gary, who is the policy manager. He conducts stormwater utility and drinking water resume. He was the CFO of the Jersey Department and director of the Transportation Fund. New Jersey promotes sensible growth, redevelop, and infrastructure investments that natural lands and water transportation access to aging, uh, aging friendly uh, and fuel on economy. I'm to have Gary uh, join us with his views, well, who's working um, on uh, issues. Uh, Andrew Rickham, uh, who is Executive Director and Chief Engineer of the King County Municipal Utility Authority. Um, over 25 years of experience, has been selected as a board certified environmental engineer and academy of environment engineers. And he recently uh, re recipient of an environmental U.S. protection in 2020 of the Chris Award, taking the time to do this today. It, it seems as though um, the sound audio is problem. I'm gonna try to uh, uh, call in um, with a different, and maybe it helps if I'm just gonna skip my slides um, and then we can have a chance to come back. But I'm hopeful um, that our, our uh, first speaker which is going to be, uh, I believe it's Gary. Gary, are, are you able to pick up from here? Sure. Ed. Great. Your sound is much better, at least okay. on my end. We'll see how that works. So, so the, to start, I guess, uh, Ed, I'm going to pick up on your side since you're uh, having a little bit of audio problem, I guess. Um, I'm going to start with the stormwater problem itself. Um, it's a climate change issue. On average, a homeowner could expect to endure a 100-year storm, which we hear about in the press from time to time, um, during the period of their 30-year mortgage. And uh, together with the fact that this past calendar year, 2018, was the wettest year on record in New Jersey, um, it, it, there's clearly a, a, a climate change issue that we're dealing with on top of a, the stormwater uh, infrastructure problem. Uh, the stormwater problem, um, by stormwater studies, something, something like 83% of the communities experience, in New Jersey experience local inland flooding um, in the course of um, the year, and 85% of the communities experience flooding outside of what you would term designated flood 
area, hazard area. So it's not necessarily confined to where sort of the usual suspects the way you would go looking for um, or expect to find flood hazards. Um, you know, if you if you read um, some of the popular uh, literature, popular science, as an example, the most important science policy facing New Jersey is getting a grip on stormwater. Uh, the volumes of water are increasing. Something like 12% of the state's area is, you'll hear this term, impervious cover, which is really a fancy now phrase that means water that hits a driveway, a roof, some kind of a hard surface where it does not um, drain into the soil is impervious cover. Something like 12% of the state's area is impervious and 95% of the state's waters don't meet water quality standards, state and federal. So we have both a um, runoff problem and a pollution problem uh, and a flooding problem. Uh, if you take a step back and look at the entire issue, stormwater infrastructure problem in its totality is something on the order of a $16 billion problem. And right now, today, there is no dedicated fund source to address that need, which is clearly um, quite large. Uh, unlike, let me say, the water and the sewer areas where there are dedicated funds, the, the stormwater area is not, does not uh, have that at the moment. So um, this brings us to my segment. And basically what I'm going to try to do is to take a peek inside this term stormwater utilities, which is a little foreign to some folks, um, and just take you through that one step at a time. So if we start sort of definitionally, um, similar to a water or a sewer utility, which I think we're all familiar with, we pay our water and sewer bills every month, uh, a stormwater utility is also a local assessment district. And the key word here is it dedicates funding specifically and solely to address stormwater management problems. That's the sole purpose of it and that's the sole use of the funds. Um, you'll see the word state mandate on the right. And basically, one of the points we're trying to get across here is there's a bill that has passed both uh, the assembly and the Senate in, in the state legislature. And it's pending on the governor's desk. It uh, goes by the title of S-1073, and that bill is permissive, word meaning that localities do not have to pursue a stormwater utility. They pursue it because it's a tool that helps them address a situation that in their um, community is a problem, whether it be flooding or water quality, but it is permissive. It's up to the town to decide whether to do that. So just to take a look at um, the financial part of this, because essentially a stormwater utility is, is a financial uh, function. And, and we used to like to use the term a flood defense user fee. Uh, the, the fee that is charged um, in this utility is, as I said, dedicated to stormwater projects. And it's based on the hard surfaces that generate polluted runoff, things like as we said, as I mentioned before, driveways and roofs and, and um, parking lots. And basically, the more runoff from a property, the higher the fee. There's a direct relationship between the two, which is not what you find in certainly in a property tax situation where there's no relationship between the value of a property and the runoff. It's not what you find if, in water and sewer rates, because as for instance, large parking lots, which generate a lot of runoff, often don't even have a water meter or a sewer, um, a sewer connection. So with that said, um, the fee, the size of the fee, when you in the sheer size of it, it varies quite a bit across the country. Uh, it, it varies ac across small and large towns, as you can imagine. But it's generally lower in smaller towns, and it's generally higher in um, places that have combined sewers, where both the sanitary and stormwater flow is in one pipe, or if they have aging systems. And just a quick point before we leave this uh, page, which I forgot to mention before. Um, this concept that we're talking about is um, well established across the country. There's something like 1,700 communities in 40 states that have already um, provided the authority to create these stormwater utilities where, where it makes sense. So if we want to get a sense of what kind of projects does this um, 
there's the stormwater utility fund. The very first thing would be the things below the ground that you sort of can't see, but that are serving the stormwater system. And these, those are things like reconstructing underground pipes, culverts, catch basins, the, the infrastructure that collects stormwater and properly channels it um, and handles it so you avoid flooding. Those, that's probably the first thing that would be addressed. Uh, controlling uh, erosion, stream bank restoration as an example. Sometimes the sheer volume of the water erodes the stream and then you get not only flooding but you also get water quality problems as well. And just reducing the, the volume of runoff. Um, I think many of us are familiar with detention basins and, and developments that are good built. And, and there's this term green infrastructure, which if you're not familiar, rain gardens, um, um, different types of buffers. And what basically these projects do is try to absorb the stormwater on site. And by doing so, it reduces the runoff and reduces the flooding risk. And as an ancillary benefit, it actually increases uh, or improves water quality. So um, sometimes we get the question, and certainly came up in the legislation that's pending, are there any incentives to reduce the cost? And, and there are. And nationally, most stormwater utilities that I mentioned before do offer partial credits. And these are sort of credits provided for voluntary on-site mitigation measures that reduce runoff. The New Jersey statute that's pending before the governor actually mandates the availability of credits. It basically tells towns, if you're going to do this, you have to provide credits of some type and they have to decide which type they will, uh, they will offer. Um, having said that, this is one of those issues in public sector where one size definitely does not fit all. Uh, a town is free um, to, if it, if it does embrace the stormwater utility, to decide what type of credit scheme or structure it, it will pursue and offer um, to those who want to do those voluntary on-site mitigation measures. The basis of the credits can be, can be effectiveness. How effective are they? Uh, do they reduce, how effective are they in reducing the flow and reducing you know, the volume? Do they meet or exceed existing stormwater standards is another basis for credits. And lastly, the degree to which they improve water quality can be yet another. So um, one of the th run by you all, a uh, series of slides uh, about a, sort of a case study. We looked at Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is a, is a state that is sort of ahead of New Jersey in terms of its implementation of these types of uh, stormwater utilities. And in the case of Lancaster, PA, they have a, what's called a combined sewer system. As I mentioned before, these are, this is one pipe instead of two that's collecting both stormwater and sanitary flow. And they've got untreated sewage during heavy storms going into the Conestoga River, which, as noted on the right, that forms, uh, feeds a basin that drains to the environmentally sensitive Chesapeake Bay. And if you're familiar with the Chesapeake Bay, it's been having its issues over the years, a lot of which is, is related to non-point source pollution, of the uh, term meaning runoff. Um, Ch Lancaster, PA, faced EPA fines of $37,500 a day if it didn't get after what is... Um, something like 750 million gallons a day of runoff in the heaviest storms. They, they, they needed a serious plan to address that situation. So since 1998, they've invested $170 million to control CSO pollutants. A lot of those are what you would term uh, gray infrastructure investments, the traditional concrete bricks and mortar type of investments. But their future choice was rather stark, as you can see. They, they either faced another $300 million to enlarge their treatment plant and build new holding tanks to retain stormwater so it doesn't all um, overwhelm the system. And if it does, you have you know, sewage going right into the uh, local water bodies. As opposed to that, it was a, it was a tab that was estimated about $140 million for a green infrastructure plan. And that's the green infrastructure being the type of project that retains on-site the water and reduces the runoff. That plan would handle the same volume of stormwater that the $300 million plan would, um, would handle. And so their decision in 2014 was to implement a stormwater utility with the green infrastructure um, plan in mind. So, um, the process that they went through is one of the reasons we wanted to highlight Lancaster. They went through a rather um, 
prolonged and arduous process of they created a green infrastructure advisory committee which as you can imagine has business owners and citizens and institutions and environmental groups on it basically created that to get feedback as they created the plan over two years worth of study now as an example they um you see there where it says extensive outreach to businesses they broke their business community down into chunks so to speak they talk to the large businesses separate from the small businesses and they talk to uh, different types of employers all as separate groups to try to engage them early on in what the a what the problem was and b what the uh, what the proposal was to fix it and they also pursued a feasibility study which is key to most stormwater utility processes the engaging of a consultant to look at how it might work So they looked at three financial options, and I sort of alluded to these a little bit before, uh, a dedicated property tax increase, a sewer fee increase, or a stormwater utility fee. And as I mentioned, the only one of the three in terms of being equitable to uh, all and where the problem really is coming from is the latter. It, that The stormwater utility fee is based on the impervious cover, that meaning the, the, the degree of runoff when, when rain hits a, a hardened surface like a roof or a driveway per property. So they, they basically that approach lets you set up the fee so that there's a direct relationship between the amount of runoff coming from a property and the amount that that property is paying. So oftentimes the uh, typical question is what is the range of fees? And as I said, the range of fees really is quite wide across the country when you look at it. But in this case, the property between 300 and 1,000 square feet of impervious area is paying about $26 a year. Property between 1,000 and 2,000 is paying about $78 a year. And obviously it would go up from there if you were talking about a, a large parking lot or a mall, those places are gonna be paying significantly more. These happen to be smaller properties and the fees attached to them on an annual basis. And then the credits, you know, 50% credit for volume controls, and green infrastructure would be an example of a volume control, and 25% for peak rate, where the control you put in is helping with flooding because it's slowing down the, the sheer volume of water that's hitting the surrounding water bodies at, at any one time. By the way, there's a little um, sort of a uh, save at Lancaster.com for more information about Lancaster in particular, if, if those are interested. So, um, Specifically, what they've recently done, they've actually, in terms of projects, they put in parking lots that capture rainwater, which is a, a neat trick. Uh, they put in um, riparian buffers. If you can picture along streams, they put in these vegetated buffers that absorb and hold water and keep it from going, just plowing into the stream. And then there's some underground storage tank reservoirs that are sort of modest in nature. But what they're trying to do is to hold up the water or absorb it on site um and ease the burden on the system so projected you know, if you look at the next five years 14 million dollar investment is going to probably uh, cut runoff by 182 million gallons a year and if you look at it over the really long lens 140 million dollar investment that i mentioned before would, would reduce the uh, runoff by 1053 million gallons a year obviously a huge increase but that's over a 25 year period the thought is that this plan would keep them within the EPA uh, guidelines and um, do it for quite a bit less money than some of the more traditional uh, solutions. Awesome. Thank you so much. I hope the sound is better. Does it seem better, Gary? I think so. Okay, great. Uh, thank you all uh, who have joined the uh, webinar uh, for your patients. I'm sorry about the bad sound quality earlier. If you uh, have a question, um, we're taking questions in the chat box, which can be accessed when you are looking at the webinar itself. If you mouse over the bottom, there's sort of a picture that looks like a thought bubble from a cartoon. If you click on that, it will open up a chat window. You choose everyone and ask your question in that. As well, um, if it's not there, there could be three dots because your window's smaller, sort of expanded, and then you would click on that, and then uh, there'd be an option to select chat, and you'll be able to ask your question by choosing everyone. And uh, next up is Andy Cricken from the Camden County Municipal okay. Utilities Authority. Andy, take it over. Uh, thanks very much, Ed. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to participate. So I think that um, for uh, from the stormwater perspective, 
uh, the, the benefit of stormwater utilities, I think there's two main ones. And the first is that, um, that there's an intentionality from, from, from a utility that is created solely to deal with um, the stormwater problem. So our utility is a wastewater utility. Um, and we're, we uh, service 37 municipalities in Camden County, um, including Camden City, which has a combined sewer system like Lancaster, uh, as, as Gary had mentioned. And so um, the first benefit is this, this benefit is sort of, of intentionality that the notice of the utility, the notion that the utility is, is dedicated and designed to deal with the stormwater problem in, in, a, in a regional basis as opposed to each town dealing with it in a piecemeal fashion. Um, and the second benefit, and, and Gary alluded to it, is that there's an opportunity for equity um, because, uh, you know, if you, especially in a combined sewer community where uh, if you have impervious surface like a parking lot that has no uh, bathroom, then you may not be generating any sewage whatsoever um, on a dry weather day. But on a wet weather day, when it rains, hits the impervious surface and goes into the combined sewer, you know, it then mixes with sewage. And if you mix a gallon of sewage with a gallon of rainwater, you now have two gallons of sewage that have to be pumped and treated just like, like the, the gallon of sewage that was generated in the, in the toilet. And yet, without a stormwater utility or without a stormwater fee, um, you, will, you know, the impervious surface won't be built. And so there's an inequitable, uh, you know, it's an inequitable situation because the, the, uh, there's not a fair apportionment of cost associated with the generation of sewage. So, um, our wastewater treatment plant is relatively large. It's an 80, it treats 80 million gallons a day on a dry weather day, but on a wet weather day, that flow can go up to 150 to 200 million gallons a day because of the rainwater mixing in with the sewage. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, in, so this is so I'm going to describe briefly our multi-pronged plan to to eliminate flooding in Camden City for up to the one-inch storm by 2020. It says one-year storm, but it's the one-inch storm, which is actually uh, more than that. So this, this is an example of how a utility, the intentionality of a utility designed to deal with this, this flooding problem. So we intend to eliminate flooding for up to the one inch storm in Camden City by the end of next year. Um, one, one approach is green infrastructure that Gary alluded to. We've already greened 100 acres in Camden City um, via rain gardens, which soak up stormwater, greening new parks, un, un, you know, depaving, uh, abandoned facilities like old gas stations, old abandoned factories, and so basically greening and conserving 100 acres and using them to soak up stormwater, and we're capturing already 100 million gallons of, of stormwater a year through the green infrastructure. Uh, next slide. Um, the, so that's the green approach. The other approach, so the, the first thing with green infrastructure, you're eliminating stormwater from even getting into the sewer system by having a soak by eliminating impervious surface, you know, paved surface, and having it soak into the ground, um, and reducing the amount of stormwater that you have to deal with to begin with. The second prong of our plan is to actually upgrade our wastewater treatment plant to receive more flow. And so using the state revolving fund, the New Jersey Environmental Infrastructure Bank, which is available to any municipal utilities authority or any municipality, a low interest loan program of less than 1% spread out over 30 years. That's also true for the green infrastructure as well. Our green and gray infrastructure programs are being funded entirely through the New Jersey Environmental Infrastructure Bank. 1%, less than 1% interest spread out over 30 years. So an investment of $100 million will only cost um, $3 million a year or so in annual debt service. Um, so, very, it, it, so we've been able to accomplish this, what we've accomplished already, the 100 green, acre, green acres, and what we're going to accomplish between now and the end of 2020, and we'll be able to do it without raising rates. And that's, again, an advantage of a stormwater utility, or in our case, a wastewater utility, that is, is designed to, to you know, solely for the purpose of dealing with this issue, as opposed to a municipality who has to deal with many other things besides stormwater, and stormwater might be a sidelight of their work. Um, next slide, please. Um, the other thing we wanted to do is optimize the combined sewer system. So again, you know, a, a stormwater utility will, will be operating the stormwater pipelines in, in a, you know, it's, it's their sole purpose, it's their mission, whereas a, a municipality has many things that on its plate, and, it, you know, and stormwater is just one of those things. So by optimizing, by, so our, our three-pronged plan basically is to, number one, with green infrastructure, soak up the stormwater and, and, and have it go into the ground so it doesn't even enter the combined sewer system. And we've already greened 100 acres, 100 million gallons per year captured. 
then upgrade the Kansas City combined sewer system so it can convey more flow to our wastewater treatment plant. And then lastly, expand the wastewater treatment plant to receive extra stormwater so that the flow will not, will, will not, not go into the river and will not go into people's basements. So capturing the stormwater, making sure that it's captured by the sewer system and coming to the treatment plant and receiving full treatment. Uh, next slide. Um, the green infrastructure program, I want to discuss that a little bit more because there's a lot of benefits to it. Um, we've created, it, it's not just, you know, there's a functionality of, of greening 100 acres and, uh, you know, thereby capturing 100 million gallons of stormwater. We've also significantly, you know, greened the city. So there's, there's, there's there are triple bottom line, you know, environmental, economic, and cost and, and community benefits from, from green infrastructure. So uh, we've created five riverfront parks for the community to enjoy over 60 rain gardens. We've also planted uh, with our partners over 5,000 new trees in Canada because they also soak up stormwater. And in, in many instances, there's an opportunity for win-wins because we're taking brownfield abandoned sites like an abandoned gas station, abandoned factories, and converting them into green infrastructure. The other thing that I always believe that good begets good. One good thing leads to more good things. And so this green infrastructure, this 100, this 100 acres of green property has to be maintained and so there's an opportunity for green jobs associated with that. And so we've uh, retained, um, we, we hire at-risk youth through an AmeriCorps program that we call PowerCorps Camden, and where the at-risk youth, uh, young men and women from age from 18 to 25, actually mean, maintain the rain gardens, get life skills training, and then get job placement um, to get a, a full-time job elsewhere, and then another cohort rolls in. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so in summary, um, our, our multi-pronged plan to deal with Camden City's combined sewage flooding problem um, by the, for up to the one-inch storm by the end of 2020 within, you know, less than, by the end of next year is to uh, maximize green infrastructure, to upgrade the Camden City sewer system to convey flow to our plant, and then to expand our wastewater treatment plant to receive the flow. This is, this is the sort of intentionality that a, uh, a, a, a dedicated authority like ours, or like a stormwater authority, if the governor passes the bill, can you know, put to the to the test and 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 put bring bear to the problem of of stormwater issues. And these issues are only going to become more prominent as you know the climate continues to change, as river levels you know rise. In, in our zone, the uh, Delaware River is supposed to rise by a foot and a half by 2050, according to uh, EPA projections. So the the, the control Imagine stormwater is going to become more and more important as time goes on. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. I can hear the excitement in your voice about the opportunity and the work that you've done um, and continue to do in Camden County and um, certainly comes through with the uh, progress that you guys have made. And I want to say thank you for that as well. Again, if you uh, have a question, this is going to be our question and answer period. Uh, we're going to go off of uh, questions that have been entered into the uh, chat box as well. Um, we've received some questions um, through email and uh, we'll be addressing some of those as well. I mean, I think one of the most important things as we're looking at stormwater and stormwater utilities in the state of New Jersey is remembering that New Jersey is the most densely populated state in the nation, which means we have a lot of concrete, a lot of pavement, a lot of building and structures that aren't meeting the current stormwater standards. Um, and all that um, rainwater, it, it doesn't have a chance to go into the earth and through natural systems to be filtered for our drinking water supply. And it ends up just going right into our waterways and causing that flooding. And if it's a combined situation, it's, um, I think these examples that we've heard are, it's some of the most egregious because they just can't handle it. And um, there's that overflow issue, which is when they can't handle receiving any more rainwater or toilet water, um, they open up a valve and it flows into the nearest waterway. Um, and certainly that's something we're looking to avoid. Um, so um, the first thing I want to mention is we are, um, we do have some opportunities going forward. Um, um, to, to address these these issues, um, and I think that we're going to have some um, some progress in the state of New Jersey because a lot of leaders are, are standing up and looking to uh, increase funding. Um, but there are some needs at the local level um, to have infrastructure as well through uh, an actual utility, which is which is great. Um, so. I want to mention too that this webinar is being recorded. So if you wanted to come back to it or you thought it was helpful, you wanted to show it to a friend or a neighbor, um, we'll be making that available as well. Um, 
the um, couple questions that we got so far, we heard uh, from Rob, and he, he had a question um, with regard to uh, Lancaster. So I guess this goes back to Gary, and whether or not they've been able to keep up with the EPA standards, are, and are they, you know, sort of still getting um, fined? Are they still paying for the the costs as they are? Um, so, Ed, uh, as I understand it in Lancaster, they are not. They, the plan that they put in place passed muster with the EPA, and, and basically they are, you know, pursuing the implementation of that plan. I think um, the EPA, I don't, I don't believe, you know, has a um, preference in terms of whether you, I think they would encourage uh, communities to do green infrastructure. That's exactly what Lancaster is doing. But the goal is to somehow arrest the the runoff which is quite significant in in that Lancaster city and, and because it's a CSO city combined sewer overflow city it's it's doubly important so I, I think the short answer is that that plan has been accepted and um, it held in abeyance what would otherwise have been a pretty steep set of penalties and that's one of the things we see sometimes is um, you know they're sort of under court order or from some agency to put together a plan that most would say probably should have been in, in a place already because the pollution is occurring. Um, and then there's some, some leniency if there's a way to, um, you know, put that in place. Um, unfortunately, folks that live along rivers or are dependent on those waterways for fishing or recreation um, sort of lose out while the system is coming up to full capacity. Um, and then, as we mentioned earlier with climate change, certainly that's a whole nother thing that we're preparing with. That's you know, advancing the need and actually raising the requirements. We are pleased to join with a number of environmental groups. So, um, you know, Gary's part of New Jersey Future, which you heard about. We also work at New Jersey League of Conservation Voters Education Fund with the Pinelands Preservation Alliance and the Association of New Jersey Environmental Commissions, which I know a lot of uh, the folks who've joined us are probably from our environmental commissions. And I want to thank you for your, your service at the local community. We work as well with the New Jersey Highlands Coalition. And we have something called Flood Defense New Jersey, which is a coalition of local and state nonprofit organizations working to protect our communities from damaging floods and the harmful stormwater pollution that's uh, occurring by helping them set up flood defense programs to build proven on the ground projects that protect against flooding, that capture the polluted runoff and repair any infrastructure that's been failing. That helps make our communities cleaner and then greener and safer. So if you're interested in learning more about how to get involved, um, and some of the work our organizations are doing, you can visit flooddefensenj.org, or you can reach out to the contact at the end of this um, that you'll get a chance to see in the presentation. We also had a question earlier from Sean um, about establishing the fees. And I, I think um, maybe we'll start with Andy and then go back to Gary um, sort of to, to turn off. But, um, you know, this is a question that comes up quite frequently is, you know, how do you assess someone's impervious coverage? You know, are folks looking at satellite imagery? Are they, you know, sort of walking around with a ruler? Is it done in the permitting process? Um, um, and I can sort of take a first stab at it, just saying that it varies from place to place. Um, but I know uh, you all have been looking at this really carefully. And as we prepare for this kind of solution, it's gonna be important to, um, you know, make it work that fits the local community. So again, one size doesn't fit all. Different communities can establish these stormwater utilities in different ways. But if you want to share a little bit about some of the methods um, and sort of uh, systems that have been set up to look at how much concrete and pavement and, and buildings a uh, property owner has. Uh, well, I think the, most, the, the easiest way is really just to, to look at um, the 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 amount of, of 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 square footage used. Now I will say this. I mean, to me, it makes more sense to look go for low hanging fruit. So I don't know if you necessarily want to go into a, like a, a residential home's driveway, for example. Or you know what I'm saying? I think you're really looking at things like parking lots, parking garages. Uh, you know, impervious surface for commercial and industrial are really the 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 real big opportunities. And um, I think it. The, because every gallon of stormwater that goes, that runs, especially in a combined sewer system like Lancaster or Camden or Newark, um, you know, every every gallon of stormwater that goes into the system ends up in 
you know, in the combined sewer system, it becomes sewage and therefore has to be treated exactly the same as though it came from a toilet or a shower. Um, it ought to be, you know, based on the, the square, the, the area, the square, you know, the square footage of impervious surface. And that's why there's a, there's a, there's a, 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 an economic incentive um, to reduce that. So what Philadelphia, you know, Philadelphia is our near neighbor here in Camden. What they do is they offer incentives um, for green infrastructure. So if you have a, you know, a large parking lot, but you 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 um, drain, have the stormwater drain to a rain garden in the middle of the parking lot, which is what we've done as a, as a, as a demonstration in our own parking lot. The stormwater all drains to a rain garden in the, in the center, and then it goes soaks it back into the ground, where none of it gets into the stormwater system. So therefore, you're not paying for the impervious surface any longer. So there's an economic incentive um, to reduce your rate or eliminate your rate by by capturing your stormwater on site, and that reduces costs. Uh, treatment cost, pumping and treatment cost, which is which makes it more equitable, and also as you said, Ed, it, it reduces the probability of there being combined sewage overflows into our rivers and streams, or or combined sewage backups into people's basements, which can happen, unfortunately. Actually, someone noticed me privately, so no one knows who it is. Uh, they had an overflow earlier today, unrelated to stormwater, um, but from uh, a problem. So it's definitely on on folks' mind. Uh, did you want anything, Gary? Uh, I would just, I would agree with uh, uh, Andy entirely. I would just say that many towns with this starting from scratch, they're doing some type of mapping because they are, of, of mapping that is of impervious coverage because they are trying to be, make sure they have something that would stand up to challenge. And sometimes that mapping is, even on a really big town, might be aerial in nature. Sometimes it's manual. But also to mention that some communities, particularly ones that have been suffering from flooding over the past oftentimes have this information, at least in large part for must, much of their town, because they've done impervious coverage assessments that were required to, to, to address some of the flooding issues, or they've done some hazard mitigation plans. So as you said, Ed, it really depends on the town, but typically there is some type of a, a mapping effort to be um, sort of to be equitable to all. Yeah, and I, I think it's important to note as well that in a place that has a combined sewer, the people that are paying the bills are the people who have um, a sewer in their house. So they're, they have showers and running sinks and toilets, um, but the parking lot owners, they're not footing the bill for their polluted runoff when it leaves the parking lot, but it is being treated at the sewage treatment facility. So a stormwater utility would allow you, for better or worse sort of word, capture that cost from the for-profit parking lot owner um, to clean up their, their water. Or better yet, they would install a system and get credits so that less water or maybe no water leaves the parking lot, much like would be if it were just nature, um, and can be cleaned up on site and not have to be put into the system. And I think that's really an important um, piece. There's one easy question on the list. Uh, Joan asked, how can I find out if my town has a stormwater utility. Well, in New Jersey currently, stormwater utilities are not legal. I think that Gary mentioned there is a bill that's uh, on the governor's desk that would allow stormwater utilities to be created at the local level. And there's a, uh, a process that uh, towns and hopefully more than one town would get together to create these, uh, would need to go through to get them set up. So currently that's not something that's happening here in New Jersey, but 40 states around the country, including Alabama and uh, many others um, have uh, stormwater utilities that are um, existing at the local level. Um, there was another question here um, about green infrastructure. So um, a lot of us you know, are locally mindful and um, if there's a way to attenuate our water so that hold it for a little while um, so that when it rains, it doesn't flow right out into the street or off of our um, property into a river. Um, a lot of folks have put in rain gardens, they absorb water more quickly into the ground, um, and rain barrels, which hold on to the water, sort of like a retention base, and then, you know, they can release it and use it for watering, or you, hold, you know, attach it to a, um, a garden hose with holes in it. Um, you know, when we're looking at those kinds of things, um, so sometimes we feel like we're maybe not making a huge difference. Um, Andy, you mentioned in, in Camden, you've been able to make a huge difference with green infrastructure, with, with these kinds of things, both um, you know, countywide with some of the lands that were developed. Um, you know, 
what kinds of impediments are there for property owners or businesses um, in finding funding to do some of this this work? You well, know, to put the plans together. Well, for example, in in Camden, and we're, again, we're borrowing from our near neighbors in Philadelphia. We have a program where we work with the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society, and we provide the rain barrels free of charge uh, to our to our residents. Um, because the note, the idea is, is that the rain barrel it's twofold, really. The rain barrel is more is is, is more cost effective than treating the combined sewage, right? Because you're and it's also environmentally beneficial. But also, it's a way of getting our our, our residents engaged so that they can be part of the solution. Um, we want them to understand that um, that this is a real a real problem. You know that that you know when kids are walking through in a, in a combined sewer community like Camden or Philadelphia or Newark, New York City, when, you know if there's if it's raining and there's a puddle, it's not just stormwater. It's not just rainwater. It could be combined sewage. And so you know you, it's it's a social justice issue. Kids should not be walking through puddles of combined sewage to get to their bus stop on a rainy day. So um, you know having rain, a rain barrel program or or a cistern um, you know, to capture your stormwater in a combined sewer community really it makes it is a way to make a positive difference. Um, and the other, so that's in the combined sewer. And you know, naturally, the green, the, the large scale investments that we're making are the most important. But you know, every little bit helps, and we want our, our, our residents to be engaged. Now, of course, by trying to optimize efficiency and also by by going for the low cost financing that the state of New Jersey offers us through the infrastructure bank. You know, we've been able to do what we've been able to do without raising rates, which is really important. And any community could do the same. Um, now, in a separate stormwater it's a system, which are the majority of the suburban municipalities, you know, it's it's not as as egregious as combined sewage, obviously, but still, um, you know, the, you know the, there's a water you know water supply shortage in certain aquifers, and allowing the stormwater to go back into the you know into the groundwater and and not go you know not flood the streets. Or you know, and especially in the case of, of as the river level rises in, in in New Jersey, which is basically almost like a peninsula of sort, or surrounded by water at any rate, um, it'll be important to, to have a stormwater go back into the groundwater and 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 capture and, and maintain it. So it's it's especially beneficial in combined sewer communities, but also beneficial in separate stormwater uh, communities as well. Awesome, and I think one of the things that's important to note too is this is um, in a in a municipality where it has a separate stormwater system, um, this would generally come out of uh, sort of taxes. And that's why the problem has gotten so big because the funding just isn't there because the pollution keeps growing as more and more development is happening. Um, so someone had asked like, you know, isn't this currently paid for in our taxes? And the, the answer is no. Um, that the, the amount of um, money, and, and it's usually very, very small, is just not sufficient. And people are flooding more and more pollution is entering our waterways and um, salt is you know, in the entering into our drinking water in the winters from, from the roads because the land is unable to, to deal with it. So we, we do need to take some pretty uh, uh, quick steps here in New Jersey. I'm gonna end this because we're a little bit over time. I wanna thank everyone. One question that was asked is um, uh, really important, which is, hey, I'm doing my uh, pavement in my condo development. Is there any money available for uh, pervious pavement, which is a really amazing thing. Um, and the answer is not really right now, but with stormwater utilities uh, collecting fees for impervious surfaces, grants could be given to um, large uh, developments where there's a lot of impervious surface because they, they make a huge difference. And Gary's gonna make a quick announcement before we wrap it up of about a great opportunity that's coming up uh, in just a few weeks, uh, Gary. Yes, yeah, just a quick note, uh, the, what's called the redevelopment forum, it happens every year, this one is March 8th, it's at the Hyatt Regency in New Brunswick. There is a whole session on, as you can see there, stormwater utilities, there's new stormwater rules coming out of DEP, and there's a whole section on the growing role of green infrastructure. So um, I would encourage anybody who's interested to, um, to, 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 to take an interest, it's a, it's a, great, uh, it's a great forum. Yeah, and I want to, th uh, uh, I've been, so I can definitely endorse it. I want to thank our two speakers, um, Gary and Andy, for joining us today, and all of you for joining us. It was really a great discussion. And as I mentioned, the PowerPoint is going to be posted on our website uh, for easy access. And if you're interested in getting more involved, uh, please reach out to Henry Guida at New Jersey League of Conservation Voters Education Fund. His email address is uh, right here for you. Um, and I want to thank you all again and wish you a very, very good night and know 
uh, sewer backups or overflows in your community. Um, thanks again, everyone. Thank, Thank you, Ed. Ed. Take care. Okay, bye-bye.